It is an archive whose opening was the fulfillment of a demand of the peaceful revolution of 1989, the Stasi Records Archive, or as it is also known, the Federal Commissioner for the Stasi Records, in short, BSTU. At the core, the BSTU is in charge of administering and making accessible the records of the Ministry for State Security of the disappeared East Germany. Those records were classified under the old regime and never meant to be public. Towards the end of East Germany, the Stasi had left behind an enormous amount of records, 111 kilometers of documents, as well as thousands of audio, video and photo records and a few data storage units who in their majority were destroyed. Those records were indexed by the archivists of the BSTU and kept from deteriorating, especially in regards to the film and audio files, so they could all be available for research. Almost 1,500 employees in 14 different locations in Berlin and the Eastern Federal States work at the BSTU. Their job is to open the archive to the purposes stipulated in the Stasi Records Act. One of the most important purposes is access to the records for those who have lived in East Germany. Reading how the state interfered in their lives gives them clarity over their fate. But the BSTU also authors reports for other agencies if they need records for a rehabilitation proceeding or to vet employees for a possible former secret activity for the Stasi. Researchers and journalists also have a right to access the Stasi records because they contribute with their publications to the understanding of the effects and mechanisms of the SED dictatorship in East Germany. And the BSTU itself contributes to a better understanding of the effects of the Stasi. Je besser wir Diktatur begreifen, umso besser können wir Demokratie gestalten. Die Stasi-Akten zeigen uns, wie eine ganze Bevölkerung durch einen Staat überwacht wurde. Und wir können heute in der Auseinandersetzung mit den Stasi-Akten unsere Sinne schärfen für die Gefahren, die auch in der Gegenwart drohen. The BSTU with its work concretely builds a bridge from the past to the present. Through a digital window into the archive, the online Stasi Media Tick through a new exhibition at the historic site, Access to Secrecy. Through events and research, as well as international exchanges about its effects. The Stasi Records Archive, creating public dialogue about the injustices of the past for Germany today. Let's take a look on the course of a lecture. You have already seen an introduction about the Stasi Records Archive in Berlin. Later I will talk about the Stasi in general and when we will make a leap to the Stasi Records Archive in Rostock and to the Stasi Remand Prison in Rostock. Last, I will talk about the Peaceful Revolution and after it we will discuss. The Socialist Unity Party of Germany, SED, governed the GDR for 40 years without ever being legitimized in a democratic election. The SED maintained its position of power by means of a huge security apparatus. One cornerstone of the system was the Ministry for State Security, MFS, or called Stasi, which was founded in 1915. The MFS was set up under the direct guidance of the Soviet secret police. As well as being a domestic secret police organization, it was also an investigative authority and foreign intelligence agency. It had its own detention centers and own armed forces. The MFS was answerable only for the SED leadership. The Stasi saw itself as the shield and sword of a party. Here you can see the logo of the MFS and on the right side the logo of the SED. Any ideas or attitudes that deviated from SED norms were considered to be subversive. In the eyes of the MFS they were a result of the influence of enemy headquarters in the West. In order to track down and eliminate hostile negative elements, the MFS sought to penetrate all areas of life of the GDR population. By 1989, the state security had about 91,000 full-time employees. 
by the Erich Mielke, the Minister for State Security from 1957 to 1989, said, The main weapon in the battle against the enemy are the unofficial collaborators, in German called inoffizielle Mitarbeiter, or shortened as EM in English IM. At the end of the East German government, there was a network of around 189,000 informants. On that picture you can see Erich Mielke on the left side in uniform. On the right side is Walter Ulbricht. He was the first dictator of East Germany until 1971. After Walter Ulbricht, Erich Honig uh, was the leader of the SED and the dictator until the peaceful revolution. He is in the middle. The GDR had a population of 17 million inhabitants, so up to 2 or 3 percent of the people worked in official for the Stasi or as an employee. So far we know it's the biggest secret police in the history of mankind in relationship to the number of the inhabitants. There are special reasons for it. The GDR was from the beginning on a dictatorship. The SED never won an election, and many people weren't followers of the regime. Since 1952 the SED built up socialism. This meant for the economy the collectivization of the agriculture, dispossessions of fabrics, handicraft enterprises, and so on. The Stasi had to assure these processes, for example through imprisonments to break the opposition. But in 1953, the Stasi failed to predict an uprising around June the 17th, and it failed to strike it down. The Soviet Red Army and the Barracked People's Police had to do this. Here you can see pictures of the uprising at the Vanu Shipyards in Rostock Warnemünde, and the lorry with soldiers of the East German Navy with white hats. With armed forces, they were able to strike the uprising down. After it, the Stasi became strengthened and got much more staff and power. June the 17th may remain a trauma for the SED and the Stasi. In 1989, Erich Mielke, head of the MFS, asked his staff, Is it the case that June the 17th will break out tomorrow? Hey, now I'm standing in front of our archive uh, of the Stasi files in Rostock. Uh, behind me you can see a building of the Stasi. It was erected in the 1970s and now we are using it as an office and also of an archive. So now please follow me into our archive. Now I'm standing in one of our index rooms here in the Stasi files archive in Rostock. Um, the administration of Rostock of the Stasi produced more than 260 different indexes about unofficial informers, for example, also about uh, uh, buildings of the Stasi and uh, especially about the victims of the Stasi. Uh, our archive contains more than one million different index uh, cards here behind me you can see a part of Noster, and it contains in different uh, drawers um, index cards like uh, this one, we made it in uh, big here, and um, this index card uh, belongs uh, to a man who was uh, called um, Wolfgang Schnur. Um, Wolfgang Schnur was a lawyer, he lived in Rostock uh, and also on the Isle of Rügen and he was one of the most important lawyers for the East German opposition scene and uh, nobody uh, knew that uh, he was uh, an unofficial informer for the Stasi and uh, um, he should become the first uh, minister president of East Germany after the first uh, three elections in 1990. It was a big uh, 
uh, star at uh, the political sky and um, but in 1990 uh, some uh, people uh, found his file cards uh, with his uh, name as an unofficial informer Dr. Ralf Schirmer and later on they uh, found also his files in our archive. He is one of the biggest uh, unofficial informers of the Stasi and one of the most important unofficial informers of the Stasi. He was a friend of many uh, oppositional leaders uh, of East Germany and uh, it became a big uh, scandal in, in 1990 in uh, the medias of East and uh, West Germany. In 1985, uh, some young people in Rostock demonstrated for peace uh, in front of uh, the memorial for the victims of the fascism. And uh, the Stasi observed uh, that action because it wasn't allowed to demonstrate in East uh, Germany. And um, some hours later, three of these young people, uh, two girls and one young man, 17, and 19 years old, uh, painted graffitis in the city center of Rostock. Um, graffitis like, uh, we can say something, but we uh, are not able to say uh, something, or uh, DDR imprisoned in German, it's DDR eingesperrt, or DDR KZ, so to say DDR is a concentration camp. And uh, that was an oppositional activity uh, for the Stasi. And uh, half a year later, the Stasi was able to identify that three young people, and uh, they were imprisoned in uh, the Stasi prison in uh, Rostock. And Wolfgang Schnur was uh, one of uh, their uh, lawyers, uh, but um, these young people did not know. Uh, that he was talking to the Stasi as an unofficial informer, of course. And uh, behind me, you can see uh, the different index cards of the Stasi only about this small case. I'm in the basement of our archive here in Rostock. It contains, as I have already said, 3.3 kilometers of uh, running files and uh, here you can see uh, some cupboards uh, with Stasi files, uh, like uh, that file of an unofficial informer here, and, uh, and these cupboards are also uh, the files of uh, Wolfgang Schnur, uh, the unofficial informer with the name Dr. Ralf Schirmer. The Stasi has also produced microfilm rolls, it uh, contains uh, files of unofficial informers, for example, and uh, our archive in Rostock uh, contains more than 4,000 of that uh, microfilm rolls and uh, the Stasi uh, produced uh, special safes uh, for that microfilm rolls. Here you can see one uh, of these original cupboards for it and it's a fire safe uh, cupboard. So it's also safe uh, for uh, war or an uprising. But um, the Stasi also planned uh, to use these uh, big heavy rolls uh, to um, make it, uh, to make microfilm rolls uh, safe. Um, they planned uh, to hide it on the ground of the seas and uh, so on. Uh, in the case uh, of a uh, war. The Stasi have also worked with databases uh, since the late 1960s. In 1981 it uh, founded the Central Persons Database and in uh, 1989 the Stasi was able uh, to save data about uh, 1.3 million uh, people. Now I'm standing on, a, I'm sitting in front of a personal computer of the Stasi. It was 
uh, Robotron A5120. It was produced in the city of uh, Dresden in uh, East Germany and yes, uh, that was a very a good thing for the Stasi. They uh, didn't uh, had to use um, files in an analog way anymore. They uh, used that floppy disks, for example, with a 1.3 uh, megabytes uh, of data about uh, persons, buildings, uh, politicians, opposition models, uh, and so on. After the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989, the Stasi realized uh, that they uh, aren't able uh, to win the fight against uh, the people of East Germany. So the Minister of uh, State Security, Erich Mielke, ordered uh, that uh, his employees now uh, going to destroy uh, their files and the proofs uh, for uh, the activities of the Stasi. Uh, the Stasi now um, burned uh, files uh, in uh, their ovens and they also used uh, machines like uh, this one next to me. It's a collab machine. It's uh, used in the agriculture uh, to uh, work with potatoes, uh, but the Stasi um, constructed it in an other way and uh, they destroyed uh, files uh, from uh, their archive. Here you can see uh, one of uh, that uh, destroyed files. And the Stasi was able to destroy about 50 percent of their files uh, in uh, Rostock. Uh, so we have only 3.3 kilometers of running files indeed. I'm standing in the floor in the basement of our archive and uh, behind uh, these doors uh, are our files of unofficial collaborators and also uh, files with uh, about uh, the victims of the Stasi, like that uh, three young people I introduced you before. And uh, this floor also contains a small exhibition about the peaceful revolution in Rostock. Um, you can see uh, some things uh, of it uh, behind me uh, with uh, pictures uh, of the Stasi about the peaceful revolutions. Uh, the pictures uh, from the demonstrations. Uh, here you can see uh, the head of a demonstration in October 1989. Um, and uh, in front of the demonstrations in Rostock uh, was always a small butterfly. Um, and here you can see uh, that uh, butterfly in the, uh, with the original material and uh, um, it's written uh, on it uh, without violence for democracy. Standing in front of the former remand prison of the Stasi, it's uh, 15 kilometers away from our archive in the outskirts of Rostock. This building behind me was uh, erected at the end of the 1950s uh, for the prisoners uh, of the Stasi. And in the background you can see some uh, bigger houses, some skyscrapers uh, that are also buildings uh, for the Stasi, for their offices and also the flats for their employees. So now please follow me and now I'm inside of a detention center, or you can say remand prison. I am here on the first floor with the cells on both sides. This building was erected, as I have already said, at the end of the 1950s. In 1960, the first prisoners came in here. The Stasi used that prison from 1960 to 1989. 
and uh, they imprisoned here 4,900 uh, people, especially uh, out of political reasons. So the Stasi imprisoned uh, here people for hostile activity, subversives, um, people who wanted to leave the country towards the west or the north to Denmark or to the Bundesrepublik uh, Germany. And people had to stay here in the middle for six or seven months and then they became sentenced by a courtyard in Rostock and uh, they had to leave uh, that prison and uh, they had to go to other prisons in uh, all, all over the country and also uh, to uh, work camps. Of course the Stasi had detention centers all over the Republic in the north of uh, East Germany. Um, we had uh, Rostock, Brandenburg and uh, Schwerin for every own district um, of the state. The main remand prison was in Berlin, Hohenschönhausen. This is the second floor of the uh, detention center in Rostock. Above me you can see uh, the third floor of uh, this remand prison and um, just uh, behind me the first floor of the prison. It's an architecture uh, you can find in uh, many prisons uh, all over the world. Uh, some people also call it uh, American architecture of a prison. Um, so it gave uh, the guards uh, the, the chance uh, to uh, see all prisoners and all other guards on the other uh, floors because the floors uh, were uh, open and uh, only uh, divided uh, by fences uh, so uh, that the prisoners uh, weren't able to commit uh, suicide from one floor uh, to another floor. Next to me is a picture of the uh, first uh, detention center of the Stasi. Uh, they used it from uh, 1950, uh, from the beginning of the Stasi, uh, to 1960, um, till the uh, new building was uh, finished, uh, I have shown you before. Um, in that uh, old prison that was built in the 19th century, uh, where the conditions are very bad uh, for the prisoners. Uh, one of the prisoners was also my uh, great uh, grandfather, Karl Garbe. He was imprisoned uh, because of uh, hostile agitation against the collectivization uh, in uh, East Germany. And um, he was imprisoned uh, for seven months from the end of uh, 1952 uh, until uh, the 7th of June in 1953 and then he came free because uh, of the uprising of the people in East Germany in June 1953 and he uh, also uh, got his uh, farm back so he was uh, very lucky. Before I will uh, tell you more about the prisoners here and uh, their daily life, we want uh, to follow the way of uh, people who were imprisoned here. So we are now going uh, to the ground floor of that detention center. Now we are at the main entrance of the prison. In the background you can see one of the vehicles of the Stasi. It's a lorry called uh, Barkas um, and uh, the Stasi used uh, that lorry to transport prisoners uh, from their home to the detention center. Usually the Stasi uh, came to the uh, subversives or hostile elements uh, as I said in the morning and uh, they only said uh, to uh, this men or women Please come with us to clear the case. And it was not uh, clear for the prisoners um, to which uh, place we um, are now going to um, because uh, that lorry hasn't any windows uh, for the prisoners. 
this uh, small lorry was able to transport indeed uh, five men or women in a special small sense. So they transported here people, for example, from the airport in Berlin Schönefeld uh, to Rostock and also uh, from uh, the borders of East Germany, for example, from uh, Poland or from Czechoslovakia. And now we are in another room next uh, to the Schleuse, the main entrance of the Stasi for prisoners. And uh, the prisoners had to go to the door to uh, the cells uh, in uh, the background. And the uh, prisoners had to go in that uh, small room for their own and they have to put off uh, all their clothes and the uh, Stasi officer uh, now uh, controlled all uh, the holes of uh, their body uh, from uh, the head uh, and uh, down. Uh, they uh, looked for uh, hidden things like uh, some tools or also uh, information uh, containers uh, um, in the case of the Stasi fort, it could be a hostile agent. The prisoners had to stay in their uh, small cells uh, for um, some minutes, uh, sometimes also for some hours, uh, and uh, after the body uh, control, they um, get new clothes uh, for uh, the prison. Um, Usually, uh, that they are uh, um, training uh, clothes uh, from the National People's Army to leave uh, all their personal uh, stuff uh, here in uh, that room. And the Stasi collected it uh, later, and uh, then the uh, people had luck, uh, they uh, could get it back in, uh, some years after uh, they were uh, sentenced and uh, they became free. Now I'm sitting in one of the cells of the detention center. The detention center contains 50 cells on three floors. The Stasi was able to imprison near 110, 110 women and uh, men at uh, one uh, moment and uh, in special cases the Stasi was also able to imprison the 240 uh, people like, uh, for example, during uh, the year 1961 when the uh, wall in Berlin uh, uh, was built. Um, when uh, the prisoners uh, entered uh, the prison, uh, they had uh, to go to one uh, of these uh, floors and uh, they uh, got a uh, cell uh, for their own with uh, one or two beds. I'm sitting now on a bed, wooden bed here on the left side and behind me you can see another bed. It wasn't allowed for the prisoners uh, to sit on the uh, beds or to uh, lay uh, every day on the bed. Uh, they, uh, it was only allowed uh, to sit on uh, one of these uh, chairs, but it wasn't allowed uh, to put uh, the bag uh, on a wall. Uh, so uh, the conditions uh, were not very good uh, for the prisoners, uh, the bed. Uh, were also very um, uh, hard and um, yes, they were imprisoned here uh, the whole day, 24 hours a day and the door was always closed uh, but uh, the personnel of the uh, Stasi controlled uh, them uh, every, uh, every five minutes or something like that uh, they um, took a look uh, through uh, the spy hole uh, in, in the door, but uh, the prisoners here couldn't say uh, that uh, they were observed uh, by an uh, officer of the Stasi on uh, the floor. Uh, the, the aims of the Stasi uh, were to get uh, confessions uh, from the prisoners because uh, the Stasi 
uh, often uh, worked with legal uh, proofs and uh, so we had uh, to legalize uh, the proofs uh, through uh, con uh, confessions of uh, uh, prisoners and uh, so uh, the uh, interrogations uh, through the Stasi officers, the, um, the interviews uh, were very, very long, especially at the beginning. Uh, often uh, they began in uh, the night and uh, often it, it took um, uh, hours and uh, hours, uh, up to 24 or 48 hours uh, uh, at, at one time. And um, so it wasn't allowed uh, to, to sleep uh, for the people in that uh, time and uh, so uh, they made uh, often uh, confessions. Uh, the prisoners uh, had only contact uh, with the prisoners uh, in their own cell, but uh, in the first time uh, they were often here in solitary confinement. Uh, so they um, were here on uh, their own and uh, they hadn't any uh, things they could uh, do. Uh, as you can see, there is a small window here, but uh, that are a special uh, windows uh, so you uh, were able to uh, take a look uh, outside and uh, some prisoners uh, did not uh, know uh, on uh, where they are, uh, that they are in Rostock at the uh, coast of the uh, Baltic Sea for example and uh, this was a part of a strategy uh, of the uh, Stasi because um, they wanted uh, to isolate them and uh, to uh, make uh, mental problems. Uh, to, they wanted uh, to produce mental problems uh, of a prisoners. So uh, for the Stasi um, it uh, was a problem that uh, people here uh, tried uh, to commit uh, suicide. Uh, but um, as I have already said, the Stasi uh, observed uh, the prisoners uh, through the spy holes and uh, the Stasi also uh, used uh, technical uh, devices uh, to uh, hear uh, what uh, the prisoners in the cells uh, uh, are saying or uh, what they are uh, doing. I have uh, changed the view of the cell. Uh, window is just uh, in front of me and here you can see uh, the entrance of uh, the cell and uh, next to the door here uh, is a toilet and uh, so the prisoners had uh, to use uh, the toilet in front uh, of their comrades in, in the cell. That was not easy, especially uh, for the women, but uh, the women were uh, on their own. So uh, in one cell uh, it wasn't allowed to, to put a man and a woman inside of it. And here uh, is also an uh, opportunity to, uh, for the prisoners uh, to wash uh, their hands and, uh, um, and their face and uh, their body. But uh, once uh, per week uh, the prisoners uh, had to take a shower, I will show it later to you. And uh, let's take a look on the door. Uh, on the upper side of the door you can see a small hole, it's uh, the spy hole for the Stasi um, officers, uh, from the person of the uh, Stasi officers who controlled um, the prisoners. And uh, in the middle of the door you can see uh, bigger hole. Uh, through that hole it uh, could be only opened uh, from uh, the floor. The Stasi officers uh, put uh, the uh, food uh, inside and also uh, things uh, to show uh, the face and uh, the toilet paper and also um, yeah, hygienic articles uh, for the women. As I have already told you, the prisoners uh, had uh, to stay here in the beginning in uh, solitary confinement. But uh, they tried 
managed to uh, stay in contact uh, with their neighbours and their other uh, sons, uh, like uh, for example Michael Krüger. Michael Krüger was in 1989 a young woman uh, and she wanted to make uh, holidays in the August or September or in the year of 1989 in Hungary and uh, as you perhaps already know uh, the People's Republic of Hungary uh, opened uh, the gates, opened uh, the border. Uh, a lot of East German people tried now to uh, leave uh, the GDR about uh, over that uh, open border between Austria and Hungary. And um, she wanted to make uh, holidays uh, together with his father and uh, also some friends. Uh, but an unofficial collaborator, uh, it was a friend of her, uh, told the Stasi uh, before that trip uh, that uh, she wanted uh, to leave uh, the country uh, during the holidays. And uh, so uh, some Stasi officers uh, caught her and uh, also his father and uh, her friends uh, on the supermoto highway uh, just outside uh, of Rostock in 1989. And uh, she was imprisoned here. And uh, she didn't uh, know uh, where uh, her father is and uh, her friends are. And uh, is, so she tried uh, to uh, make a contact uh, through the vaults uh, to uh, their neighbors. And uh, in the prison, the prisoners had a special um, knocking alphabet uh, to communicate from uh, one cell to another. And um, it was a, a great surprise uh, for her uh, that uh, one of her friends was uh, in the neighbor cell. And um, the a knocking alphabet is uh, working like that. One knocking stands for an A, two knockings for a B, three knockings uh, for a C, and uh, so on. It uh, took several hours uh, to make a uh, whole sentence, uh, sentences uh, for the prisoners, uh, but they had a lot of time here. And they were uh, very isolated. They had no radio no television, um, they could uh, uh, get books uh, from the Stasi, but not at the beginning. Uh, the Stasi uh, gave them only books if they uh, made a uh, confession uh, after uh, some uh, hours or weeks or some, some days or perhaps. Another uh, communication opportunity for the Stasi was uh, the toilet telephone. Uh, in that case, uh, the prisoners opened uh, the toilets and uh, they talked through the tubes to uh, each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, the, uh, the prisoners uh, could talk to cells above there or uh, under uh, the cell because uh, the tubes uh, were. Uh, in, in this wall, uh, um, up and uh, uh, down. For detail to look on the windows of my cell, uh, as I have already said, it was not a normal window, so here you can see it's very stable and you can't see what's going outside. Uh, it was uh, often a uh, very bad uh, air surrounding in the cells. Uh, prisoners only could open this small hole and so they get that a little bit more fresh air from here. But in winter it uh, was very cold often in, in the cells and uh, people told us uh, they are imprisoned here 
that uh, they had uh, to do sports uh, to um, so it's not to cope uh, for them. Um, behind that wall with a small holes here is a radiator for my heater and um, I learned that the you know, heater uh, didn't work very good uh, so as I have already said it often was relatively calm in the science. Now we are in the basement of a detention centre. Here behind me you can see some small cells, we call it dark cells. People had to come here if they destroyed cupboards or beds in their cells or they didn't want it to make a confession. It was allowed uh, to imprison them here for uh, two weeks and uh, usually we started uh, put off uh, the light and uh, sometimes there was also uh, water on the floor so we had uh, to stand in the water. There was no bed, no cupboards or, or a heat uh, so it was uh, very cold and uh, wet there and um, often of the prisoners uh, uh, they um, had uh, mental problems uh, here and uh, so often uh, they confessed the things the Stasi uh, wanted uh, uh, of them. Um. Now we are in the courtyard for the prisoners of the detention center. This uh, detention center had uh, three cells like uh, this one uh, for, uh, for people who were in that uh, prison and uh, we should go out uh, once a day for one hour uh, so it was written down in the orders of the Stasi but uh, that was not the reality. In reality uh, the prisoners uh, could go out here only for uh, five minutes, ten minutes, uh, once a day, and not on uh, every day of the week, uh, often only uh, three days uh, per week or, or something like that. Um, we have also talked uh, to former prisoners uh, of that de detention centre uh, who uh, told us uh, that they never came out here uh, during the three months uh, of uh, uh, their stay uh, here in uh, the detention centre. Uh, behind me you can see perhaps uh, the shadow of a uh, fence. Um, uh, this fence uh, was uh, erected uh, above uh, the heads of the prisoners uh, so uh, that the prisoners uh, uh, weren't uh, able to throw uh, in German it's called a Kassiba, that's a word, uh, that's a Yiddish word um, that are small sheets of papers uh, with small um, with small with small content uh, for, for other prisoners. Some prisoners uh, try uh, to find out uh, if uh, some relatives of uh, their uh, who were imprisoned in the same moment uh, like uh, themselves uh, staying uh, at this moment uh, perhaps also here. We have also uh, some casibas of uh, two Polish uh, prisoners. Uh, these two Polish prisoners uh, tried uh, to reach uh, West Germany because uh, some relatives um, uh, left the People's Republic of Poland uh, in the 1980s uh, uh, to Hamburg, but they were uh, in prison, uh, caught, they were caught uh, at the border uh, in East Germany towards uh, the West, and uh, they were two brothers, and uh, one brother um, wrote on this uh, Cassibas uh, down, uh, for example, Janek um, halte durch. Uh, that means uh, in uh, German, uh, in English, sorry, uh, Janek, uh, stay strong. So there are the Kassibas uh, I've uh, talked about uh, from uh, the Polish prisoners. 
Uh, it's written down on a silver paper with uh, their nails because, uh, of course, we hadn't a pencil or things to write down. And the Stasi uh, found this uh, Cassibus and on uh, the left side you can say uh, the information of the Stasi about uh, that case. Uh, perhaps you're wondering why uh, there are uh, some uh, black uh, stripes there. Uh, we had to, to uh, black uh, the names uh, because uh, uh, we don't have uh, the permission of this uh, Polish uh, guys uh, to name uh, them because we uh, don't have uh, any contact. Now you can see another view of uh, the courtyard for the prison as of that uh, detention center. The detention center is uh, just uh, behind me and uh, behind me you can see also a wall. That's a reconstruction of uh, the wall because uh, the original uh, walls uh, between the different uh, six uh, cells uh, were teared down after 1989 because that place was uh, used of, as a prison for some more years after uh, the reunification uh, of Germany and also the months uh, before. Um, now you can see also uh, the fence uh, I have already talked about. Now you can see above me a gangway. This gangway was used uh, for um, the personnel of the Stasi uh, who had uh, to observe uh, the prisoners here outside in the courtyard. Uh, this guard uh, had a small machine gun uh, with him uh, from uh, Kalashnikov uh, from the Soviet Union and uh, he had uh, to prevent uh, people to uh, flee uh, outside uh, this courtyard. Um, and he had also to use, uh, to observe uh, the prisoners here because it wasn't allowed to sing, uh, to dance, to do sports or uh, to talk uh, to other prisoners uh, just behind uh, the other walls. This detention center had uh, three different shower rooms. That's uh, one of it and uh, the second floor. Uh, behind me you can see three uh, showers and uh, it was allowed to, to take a shower um, once uh, per week and uh, they, but uh, the prisoners had only a shower together with their comrades from one cell so uh, they can't, couldn't see here uh, any other uh, prisoners of that uh, detention centre. Um, they had uh, to uh, put out their clothes uh, here in uh, the shower and uh, they had uh, to uh, put it here through uh, that door and in the meanwhile the Stasi officers uh, controlled their clothes and uh, they looked for example for small chiefs uh, like the Kassibas uh, I told you. In the winter it was often relatively cold uh, inside uh, here, so uh, sometimes uh, the prisoners had to stay here you know, also for a half hour or, or for one hour uh, naked without clothes and uh, they are freezing. Now I'm standing in front of that shower room I have uh, shown to you. Uh, the Stasi officers uh, didn't go away during the shower procedure. The Stasi officers observed all the time the prisoners in the shower uh, through that window and also uh, through a spy hole in uh, the door. That was not nice uh, for the prisoners, especially uh, for the female prisoners. Um, of course, uh, most of the employees of the Stasi uh, in uh, the in the detention center were uh, male uh, persons and uh, some of them uh, had uh, fun uh, to uh, observe uh, the female prisoners. 
and uh, the Stasi officers were also able uh, to control the water here with uh, these uh, water taps. So they were able to uh, stop the whole water uh, to harass uh, the people, uh, to make them angry, or uh, they also uh, could stop the warm uh, water so that they could, could only uh, shower with uh, cold water. One of my most favorite examples in our new exhibition is the case of uh, Silke Glaser. Silke Glaser was a 19 years old a student uh, from uh, Schwerin, but uh, she lived in Boston. In uh, 1988, uh, she uh, made the decision to fight against the SED regime with uh, small uh, agitation uh, papers. Uh, like uh, that one, it is written uh, Freedom for Stefan Kratschik, Kratschik, who was a very uh, famous uh, oppositional and uh, singer-songwriter in East Germany, and uh, uh, she um, spread uh, these small flyers uh, by night in the year 1988, and you can see some more uh, flyers uh, for example, freedom uh, for people who are thinking in another way or on this uh, cheat is written uh, there is uh, the freedom of opinion in our country. And uh, she was uh, at first prisoned by night by the people's police and uh, she had uh, to pay a fee of uh, 500 uh, marks of East Germany. That was, uh, uh, was much money uh, for uh, inhabitants of East Germany at uh, this moment. Um, but uh, some years before, um, to do things like uh, this one, uh, she would uh, uh, sentence uh, to uh, um, by, by the judge uh, to the uh, prison, of course. But in 1988, uh, the SED regime wasn't that strong uh, like in uh, the years uh, before. Uh, but uh, she didn't uh, give up and uh, she produced more uh, flyers like uh, this one. And um, so the Stasi at court, right? and um, she was imprisoned also here in that uh, detention uh, center. After some months of uh, staying here, she was uh, sentenced by a judge uh, to one year and uh, three months of uh, prison. Uh, but um, some uh, months later, she was. Uh, uh, she, she became sold free by the West German government, like uh, many thousand other uh, political uh, prisoners of East Germany, and so uh, she could move uh, from uh, the prison in uh, Karl Marx uh, city uh, to um, West Germany. You have heard already some facts about the peaceful revolution in East Germany in our exhibition in the Stasi Records Archive of Rostock. Now I want to talk about some more details of the Stasi and the Peaceful Revolution. The flops for the Stasi in 1989 began with the local elections at May the 7th. Oppositions had the courage for the first time to monitor the elections. They published the falsification of the votes in underground news but the West German media talked about it and wrote about it too. Many East German inhabitants saw television or listened to radio stations from the Bundesrepublik, so they became informed about it. Restlessness arises. The next step in the line of failures for the Stasi was the stepwise opening of a border between Hungary and Austria since June the 17th. The Stasi couldn't stop the escape wave. Only in individual cases, like the case of Maybrit Krüger, the secret police was able to imprison refugees on their way to Hungary. But the Stasi informed the SED detailed about the number of refugees and their reasons as far they were known. 
Here we can see a picture of left cars by East German fugitives in Hungary collected from of the Stasi near Berlin. In the meantime, in September, many members of the opposition in East Germany came together to found the new forum, in German Neues Forum. For the first time, we now had a common platform for oppositional activities. The SED didn't allow the establishment, but the regime was not able to prevent the new forum to spread. The Stasi informed the SED also here detailed about the constitution and its members. That was possible because from the beginning unofficial collaborators took part in the process. With these collaborators the Stasi tried to destroy the new forum from inside. When this did not succeed, the IN should guide the way in the NF in the desi desired direction. But that didn't work too. The new forum initially had problems gaining a foothold in the north. Here we can see a document of the Stasi about a collection of signatures uh, at the University of Rostock among students uh, of medicine. In September, the mass demonstration in Leipzig had begun. The entire GDR was covered by demonstrations in, at the end of October, also in the north. The first demonstration in Rostock took place on October the 19th. The Stasi took part too, of course. Unofficial collaborators collected information about the participants, the aims of the demonstrators. So-called social forces of the SED tried in cooperation with the Stasi to provoke the other demonstrators. Agents took pictures of the demonstrations to identify members of the demonstration march. Here you can see a marker arrow above the head of a young man. The Stasi also used video cameras to document the events in October and November 1989. Here we can see a screenshot of a video camera in front of the main entrance of the Stasi district administration in Rostock. In the middle you can see Joachim Gauck. Joachim Gauck was a priest in Rostock Iversagen at this time and also a victim of the Stasi. And later he became the first federal commissioner for the records of the Stasi and uh, later uh, the President uh, of the Federal Republic of Germany. He's talking to other young politicians and uh, on the left side you can see a document of the Stasi, it's an observation report. The Stasi did not have only video cameras, they had also a lot of weapons and they were well prepared to prevent people to occupy the building. Here we can see a defense plan of the district administration of the Ministry for State Security in Rostock from 1989. The main objectives of the protesters were free elections, freedom of travel, better food and other supply. But the dissolution of the state security was also a very important goal. As a token of the fire dick protest, the demonstrators carried burning candles with them and partly set them down at the feet of the Stasi employees. On December the 4th, vigils against the destruction of evidence were held in front of the Stasi buildings all over the country. Here we can see a picture of the vigil in front of the main entrance of the Stasi in Rostock. The Stasi saw at this moment no more other solutions to surrender. So they gave up and uh, members of the civil rights movement were able in Rostock to occupy the Stasi district administration as uh, the second district administration in East Germany in the night uh, from uh, December the 4th 
uh, to the fifth. On that picture you can say the head of the district of Rostock of the Stasi, General Mittag, and I think you can say also his fear in his eyes. Members of the civil rights movement not only found unsettled employees of the Stasi, but also burning fires in the ovens of the Stasi, like here in uh, Waldeck, the place of our Stasi Records archive, Rostock. Unfortunately, the Ministry for State Security in East Berlin was not occupied until January the 14th in 1919. This meant that many documents go, could still be destroyed there. We assume that around 30 to 40 percent of the files were shredded or burned. But the files that have been preserved are a real treasure for every historian and still hold research potential. Also about the peaceful revolution. Here we can see the cover of a collection of documents about the peaceful revolution from our archive. You can download it for free. Thank you for your attention.